Okay, so you are buying a new camera and you've noticed a pattern. There are a bunch of tech specs for all of the cameras that you don't really understand. I'm gonna share with you the seven most important camera tech specs and then I'm going to demystify each and every one of them. I'm Colette Nickel, the founder of Story Envelope Media and you are watching The Micro Filmmaker. All right. Let's get down to these tech specs and demystify some of them. So we're gonna go over seven tech specs today. Resolution, frame rate, sensor size, and crop factor, the lens mount, and then image stabilization and EVF, which is electronic viewfinder. So let's get started with resolution. Resolution is something that gets hyped quite a bit, especially these days. Resolution refers to the lines of resolution in your image. And the higher the resolution your image, the greater detail you can see, the greater clarity. Hold that thought. So the higher resolution an image is, the greater the detail you can see, the greater the clarity and the sharpness. Now you can have an in-focus image that is low resolution and that will look sharper and more clear than if you have a high resolution image that's not in focus. So resolution has nothing to do with focus. It just has to do with how much detail you can see. Now, let's go a little bit deeper. So early days of television, everything was in SD. SD is standard definition. Next we have HD. HD stands for high definition and most commonly you find 720p, 1080p, and 2K as well as 4K. These are all high definition resolutions, but what do they actually mean? So with 720p, you have an image that is 720 lines of resolution by 1080 lines of resolution or 1080 lines of resolution. So it's 720 um, vertically and 1080 horizontally. So 720 by 1080 re is referred to as 720p. And this is the standard resolution that you watch uh, videos on YouTube with. It's the perfect resolution for streaming. You seem to be able to stream most things in 720p without a lot of stuttering. Next you have 1080p, which is twice the amount of resolution as 720. It is 1080 by 1920. These days 1080p is the standard uh, resolution for anything that is going to be used online. Next you have um, 2K. 2K is 6% more resolution than 1080p, so it is not that much more. So don't get caught up in anything around the 2K format. It's not really a big deal. The difference, the main difference between 1080p and 2K is actually that 2K has a, a wider aspect ratio. 720p and 1080p have an aspect ratio of 16.9. That means the frame size or the field of view is 16.9. So if you go onto Netflix and you watch uh, most TV shows, their aspect ratio is 16.9. 2K is a little bit wider than that. It is, I believe, 1.8 to 1. <laughs> bit wider so it's a widescreen format and it used to be the standard for viewing things on the big screen um, it is not anymore the standard for the big screen is now 4k so let's talk about 4k for a quick second 4k is not necessary at all if you are shooting predominantly for online media so you don't need to get sucked into the marketing machine about 4k that's because when you upload 4k to the internet it is not really going to play nicely and most people are not going to watch it our internet today in 2018 and probably for at least the next five to ten years is still too slow to handle 4K. So the people who want to buy 4K cameras are people who are going to be making short films or feature films designed to be viewed on the big screen. Just to summarize resolution, basically all you need to know is, is this camera a camera that does 1080p, so high definition in 1080p? Um, if so, at what frame rate does it do 1080p? And that moves us into talking about frame rate. Frame rate is shown as FPS, not SPF, that's FPS or frames per second. So if you're looking at the tech specs of a camera and it says uh, 120 FPS, that is saying that the camera will shoot 120 frames per second. Now frame rate is actually pretty important. It definitely has a huge effect on your final image. So let's just break down 
uh, what the different frame rates actually mean. So 24 FPS or 24 frames per second is the standard frame rate for film. So almost all movies these days are still shot in 24 frames per second, even though they're shot digitally. And that's because 24 frames per second is technically um, a legacy standard. 24 frames per second comes from the old days of shooting analog film. Um, movie moguls discovered that the cheapest number of frames per second that you could shoot using analog film without the human eye detecting that it was watching a bunch of still images uh, slipping by the eye is 24 frames. So 24 frames per second was just a choice made out of sheer economics, not because it's better in any way. And in fact, 24 frames per second is actually a little tough on the eyes. Your eye can't detect that, it, it's, that it's watching 24 still frames, um, but there is eye strain. Whereas, for example, 45 frames per second is quite easy on the eyes. So you have 24 frames per second, which is considered filmic. Then you have 30 frames per second, which people consider like a video look. Um, but in reality, it, it's not a video look. It's just um, more frames per second. You have less motion blur and sort of a crisper image. And it's going to seem more real. And it's also easier on the eyes. So that is a benefit. Um, then you have 60 frames per second. Uh, that is typically used for slow motion. Just for going out and shooting normal things, 60 frames per second is maybe a little bit of overkill. Obviously, the more still images you cram into a second of video, the more data you have and the larger your file sizes are. So you don't want to just arbitrarily shoot things in 60 frames per second because your file sizes are going to be just a lot bigger. So anyway, you have 60 frames per second. You have 120 frames per second. You also have 240 frames per second. I don't know if people are getting even more than that these days, but those are the main ones. And once you're getting 60 frames per second and higher, the only reason you're going to use those really is for slow motion. So don't worry about those higher frame rates unless you know that you want to shoot a whole bunch of stuff in slow motion. And if you do want to shoot a whole bunch of stuff in slow motion, that you, then you should check and see, um, are those 60 frames per second that you're getting going to be in 1080p or is it only in 720p? Because that is what you often see, is that a camera will offer 120 frames per second, but it's only in uh, 720p. And so maybe that's not really that useful, to be honest. Because if you're shooting slow motion, you probably want to shoot higher resolution than 700 and 20 pixels. So that is what you need to know about frame rate. Next thing we're going to look at is sensor size. Sensor size doesn't really matter all that much these days. Sensor size used to be kind of a big deal because um, basically the larger the sensor size, the better the image quality just in general. But the sensors are getting so good that even a smaller sensor will give you a really good image quality. So the reason you need to know about sensor size is mostly because sensor size goes hand in hand with crop factor. So we're going to talk about two tech specs right now, sensor size and crop factor. So if you get a full frame sensor, which um, will probably be a 35 millimeter sensor, that is going to have a zero crop factor. So you can put your 50 millimeter lens on it and it's going to look the way it is supposed to look. It's not going to be cropped in at all. Whereas if you use a camera that has a smaller sensor, the most common sensor these days on DSLRs is the APS-C, and that has a crop factor of 1.6. So if you're using a camera that has this APS-C sensor, you put that 50 millimeter lens onto your camera, rather than looking like it should look, it's actually going to be cropped in. Hold that thought. And then you also have Micro Four Thirds cameras that have a Micro Four Thirds sensor, which is even smaller than the APS-C sensor, and that has a crop factor of two times. So if you take your 50 millimeter lens, you take it off that full frame camera, you put it onto your mirrorless camera, it is going to give you a field of view that is half that of what you were looking at on the full frame camera. So that is why knowing the sensor size matters, because you want to know what the crop factor is. And if, for example, you're super obsessed with 
wide shots and you want a wide angle of view, then getting a camera like a mirrorless camera that has a smaller sensor is not going to be your best bet because it's going to be very difficult for you to get those wide shots that you're looking for. If wide shots are something that you're obsessed with, then you are going to want to get a full frame camera with a large sensor. If you're shooting for online purposes, you're making micro films or online videos, then wide angle shots are not really in your best interest because when people are watching your your video, your microfilm on their smartphone or their iPad or on the computer or whatever, um, these wide shots that look great on the big screen do not look that great on the small screen. You can't really see what's going on. So in my opinion, having a big sensor doesn't really matter. Getting a camera with an APS-C sensor or a micro four, four third sensor is perfectly fine. You're going to get great results. The image quality is going to be great. It's just knowing what your crop factor is. The next thing that is actually quite important to know about, and I think that most people don't really know how important this is when they're buying a camera and then they just realize that they've bought into a certain format a little bit late in the game because they don't understand the lens mount. So we are just going to look at this camera here to figure out what is a lens mount. So when you're buying a camera, you are basically buying a camera body, which is a computer. Um, and every camera body has a different lens mount. Um, so you have different brands of cameras, Canon and Nikon, for example, they have different lens mounts, which means that if you take a Nikon lens and you try and put it onto a Canon camera, it is not gonna work because they have different lens mounts. So let me just show you, I just took the lens off here. This is the lens mount right here. So this lens mount is an EFS lens mount and it is designed to fit this lens, which is an EFS lens. So the reason you need to know about lens mounts is because you need to know that you're basically, when you're buying a camera body, you're basically buying into a lens mount system. So if you buy a Canon body, it's going to either be EFS, um, which is what all of the crop sensor cameras are, or it's going to have an EF lens mount. Now, if it's EFS, that means you can put any EFS lens onto it, works great. You can also put any EF lens onto it and it'll work fine. And the EF lenses in the Canon line are, they tend to be just a lot higher quality. You have an L series in Canon that is really, truly excellent professional quality glass. You can put any of those professional lenses onto your EFS camera and it will work perfectly fine. <laughs> There is an adapter for almost anything. So you can take vintage lenses from the 50s and put them onto your modern camera and they work great, but you're only gonna get the full functionality of the lens if you have a very expensive lens adapter. The cheaper adapters will not allow you to use the electronics that you might have in a nice new fancy lens. So automatic focusing um, and automatic exposure will not be functional if you're using a cheap lens adapter. Whereas if you buy an expensive lens adapter, then you can use the full functionality, the electronics of the lens. But you don't wanna make the mistake of buying a camera body and then buying a lens that is not compatible and then having to buy an expensive lens adapter and they're over a thousand dollars to make the electronics of your lens work with your camera. So I've talked about this in a previous video. If you're buying your first camera, just buy the camera with the kit lens. It'll be crappy, you'll use it for a while and then you'll eventually upgrade. But just know, when you're buying a camera, you are buying into a lens system. The next thing that you should know about is image stabilization. Now you can have image stabilization in the camera body itself or you can have it just in the lens. I've noticed that with Canon cameras, they tend to have image stabilization just in the lens, not in the body, um, which means that if you use, say, a vintage lens on your Canon body, you're not gonna have any image stabilization because the body has no image stabilization and the lens has no image stabilization. Image, stabiliza image stabilization is shown in your spec sheet as IS, um, and so it might say on the next to the lens IS and that means the lens has image stabilization now the point of that is so if you're taking handheld um, footage that it's just gonna look a little less kind of um, shaky now I've noticed that with Panasonic cameras there tends to be image stabilization 
in the body itself. You need to make sure that you either have image stabilization in the camera body or in the lens because invariably you're going to be shooting handheld at some point and you want to make sure that that is a little less shaky than it would be without image stabilization. Now the last tech spec that you should know when you're buying a camera is EVF. EVF is electronic view finder. Most, if not all micro four thirds cameras, I think it might actually be all micro four thirds cameras have an electronic viewfinder. So what does that mean? That means you look into the viewfinder. So in case you're wondering, viewfinder is this little eyepiece here. So you look in to the viewfinder and what you are seeing is not the um, actual image of the world, it is a digital image. So you're looking at a digital screen when you look inside of the electronic viewfinder. That is uh, super useful if you're shooting outside because when you're shooting outside, your LCD screen um, just doesn't show up very well. You cannot see your LCD screen very well at all when you're outside on a super sunny day. So if you are gonna be doing a lot of shoots outside, then having an electronic viewfinder can be very, very useful. But if you plan on also doing some photography and you don't like looking at an electronic viewfinder, um, then it's not a great purchase for you. So what you wanna do is make sure you go into a camera store, preferably one of those big box stores where people just ignore you, and check out that electronic viewfinder and see if you like it or not. I personally don't enjoy looking at them at all, so I would only use a camera with an electronic viewfinder for video. I wouldn't use it for photography. A good thing to know is that there is an easy workaround for people who don't want an electric viewfinder but are gonna be shooting outside a lot. You can use, um, like an analog viewfinder that you put onto the camera. Um, it has an eyepiece and you can look at the viewfinder and it will magnify it. And I can actually show you that right now. And then it just kind of clicks into place. So you can see like that comes with a little lanyard so you can carry it around your neck like a big old nerd. Um, and it's not that expensive. It is around, I think it cost me $150, including shipping from Europe to Canada. So that is actually a pretty good deal. And so just keep that in mind if you're not buying a camera that has EV, um, EVF. And that's actually it. Those are the top seven uh, specs that you need to know when you're buying a camera that will also help you use your camera to the best effect. If you enjoyed this video, make sure that you go over to storyenvelope.com, which is my website where I help people to learn how to make microfilms and movies. And you can take my teeny tiny micro filmmaking course for free. And also make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that the micro filmmaker videos will pop up in your feed. That is all for now. Thank you so much for watching and 